Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every present heart be acceptable to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, most people love cause and effect relationships. Uh, Let me give you an example. Uh, How many of us are told if you eat right, drink lots of water, get plenty of sleep, and lead a low-stress life that you're going to be healthy? Has anyone ever heard that before? Yeah, well, a couple of you have, right? And and it's kind of, you know, if you do these things, generally speaking, these things are going to happen. You know, another clear cause and effect is this. If you're a farmer, and if you take good seed, you plant it in good soil, and you have plenty of moisture and and the proper amount of sun, the effect is you're going to have an amazing crop that's going to grow up. And that's really good. There's another cause and effect, and that's this, that if you are a good parent and if you have a good family and and, and you do the things that you're supposed to do and to glorify God, generally speaking, you're going to have an an amazing heritage. You're going to have an amazing legacy that you're going to pass on to future generations. And inversely, the same is true. That if you reject God, if you live your life for yourself, if you reject the principles of of what it means to be a godly parent, generally speaking, there will be lasting negative effects for many generations. There is an American educator named A.E. Winship, and he researched cause and effect in family legacy by analyzing the legacy left by a very popular preacher named Jonathan Edwards. Right? This guy was popular amongst really Christians and, and even people that weren't Christians. He was well respected. He gave powerful messages. And there was another researcher who was a sociologist named Richard Dugdale who looked at another family, except instead of it being a, a positive look, uh, it was more of a, of a negative look. And his name was Max Jukes. Right? So these, these two men were compared in contrast. They lived about the same time, Jonathan Edwards and Max Jukes. And they looked about 150 years after their death to look at what happened. The effects of Jonathan Edwards' legacy is this. There is one U.S. vice president, one dean of a law school, one dean of a medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, don't hold that against them, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. Wow. Right? This is all from the legacy of one man and his wife. Winsip noted that Edwards was not just a godly man. He was hardworking. He was intelligent. And perhaps the best thing is he had a very good wife. Winship uh, says much of the capacity and talent and intensity of character of more than 1,400 of Edwards' family is due to Mrs. Edwards. It seems that both Mr. and Mrs. Edwards played a powerful role on leaving a godly legacy that had a very beneficial outlook for those around them. Now Max Jukes, he also had a legacy, although not a good one. Jukes' descendants included seven murderers, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 other convicts, 310 paupers, 440 who were physically wrecked by alcohol addiction. Of the 1,200 descendants that were studied, 300 died prematurely, along with having 42 different men in the New York prison system that could be traced back to Max Jukes. Both Edwards and Jukes lived about the same time, but they had vastly different legacies. It seems, at least from this snapshot look of two families, that who our parents are and how they live their lives plays a very important role on what happens to the generations that follow them. Family is important. Legacy is important. 
And today as we dive back into our series of hard passages from the book of Genesis, we have to quickly have a a short overview of of Bible history and, and take a look at some of the parents and some of the legacies to see what is being passed on. We have Noah and the flood that has long since passed. Abraham left his extended family. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And it was just him and his wife, Sarai. And they had their nephew, Lot, and his wife. And as time passed, Abram and Sarai had their names changed, as well as having a son named Isaac. Isaac also had a son named Jacob. And Jacob's name got changed too. Does anyone remember? Israel, very good. All right, so then Israel had a whole mess of sons. He had a dozen sons. And these dozen sons, these 12 sons, became the patriarchs of the tribes of Israel. So each son was kind of the head of of, of each tribe, right? And you can see kind of on the chart here, you have these 12 sons. And Judah was one of those tribes. He was one of those sons of Israel. But that's a little bit further into the future. Today I want to focus on one man, Judah, who was alive and had a mixture of positive and negative parenting and life choices. I don't plan on rereading the text that Mickey did a wonderful job reading, uh, but we're going to be working through Genesis chapter 38 if you'd like to follow along and take a look at what we're talking about. Now, Judah's brother, Joseph, had already been sold into slavery. And Judah and the other brothers had grown older and married and had children by this time. Judah unwisely took a wife from the people that lived near them called the Canaanites, Even though God had told Abraham and his family to be separate from them, some of the legacy, some of the children decided it really wasn't that big of a deal. So Judah took a wife who was a Canaanite. They had three sons. Judah's firstborn son was named Ur, and he took a wife named Tamar. Not surprisingly, Ur was wicked in the Lord's eyes and died at an early age. And it was customary for Tamar to be given to the next male child that hadn't been married from Judah, and his name was Onan. Onan was also very wicked before the Lord, and like Ur, Onan died early on. Now, Tamar should have been given to the next brother in line, Shelah, the last of the boys of Judah. Only Judah never followed through with allowing his son to be married to Tamar. I mean, to be fair, Tamar, man, she married men, and those men died. And he probably thought, I don't want my line to be taken out. Well, over time, Judah's Canaanite wife died, and Judah fulfilled his sexual drive with the woman he thought was a prostitute that he saw. The big problem was that this woman that he thought was a prostitute was actually his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And to make matters even more complicated, he got Tamar pregnant. And when word got back to Judah about Tamar and his, his daughter-in-law's pregnancy and that she never married again, he was furious and demanded that she should be killed because she was unfaithful. She did not wait. And after Tamar produced evidence that Judah was the one that impregnated her, he confessed that she, Tamar, was more righteous than he, and he owned up to his sin. Judah did not sleep with Tamar again, but Tamar in time did deliver. In surprise, Tamar had twins, Perez and Zerah. Now this is perhaps an odd chapter to be preaching on, especially in light of of my building the case of of cause and effect and and having this godly legacy and passing it on and and how important godly parents are as as we lead a a, a legacy behind us and we want it to be a positive one. I have a very important point that I'm about to make. And it's critical that you hear. If you're, if you're zoning out and, and you're thinking about the, the NBA draft or, or you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner, I'm going to ask that you reel it back in right now. Here it is. Generally speaking, good, God-fearing parents can leave behind a good and powerful legacy. Now some of you, if you're honest, you hear that and you're a little depressed. 
Maybe you're thinking, I, I, I didn't have that, Pastor. I, I didn't have that good and godly legacy. Here's another equally important point. Just because you have skeletons in your closet, just because perhaps your family is not all perfect, doesn't mean that God can't or won't bless the socks off of your legacy and take those sinful choices, turn them on its head, and make a powerful statement about God's ability to redeem that which is broken, to save that which seems unsavable, and to bless what shouldn't be perhaps blessed. Some of you come from, from legacies that are spiritually deep and strong in the Lord. I remember when I was in seminary, Dr. Monseth, he was the, the dean of the school and he was the, kind of the patriarch of, of, of the seminary for quite some time. And they, they named a building after him. And he has a very godly family. And, and I, you guys probably have heard of Dr. Monseth in, in, in your time. Uh, you perhaps didn't know him very well, but, but I did. And I remember Dr. Monseth was, was teaching in, in class one morning, and he shared this, this illustration about Jonathan Edwards and Max Jukes. And I had forgotten about how he shared that until I started working on this and doing some research. And then I remembered, oh yeah. And then I also remember how I felt. And I was like, hmm. You know, I'm so grateful for my mom. Strong, dedicated Christian. He's prayed for me before I was even born. And she has encouraged me to follow after God with my whole heart. And I'm so grateful for her. But as I look back on, on the way that my father raised me, uh, I, I don't ever really remember him praying with me. Uh, I, I think he maybe read the Bible to our family one time. And, and, and there's a lot of things that he left to be desired as far as parenting and giving a, a legacy to me. And I remember Dr. Monseth sharing about Jonathan Edwards. And then I started to kind of picture in my mind, man, Dr. Monseth, you've got an awesome family. You've got a, you know, this godly heritage that you have, and you're passing on to your children, and, and they're going to likely pass on to their children. And if you look at the Monseth family, it, it's a great legacy. But then, then I started to feel really bad uh, about myself, and I thought, man, God, I don't, <laughs> I don't come from a great legacy. I remember my mom telling me one time, well, Richard, I, I don't know of any pastors in our family except for one, and then he left the ministry and moved to California and became a chicken farmer. <laughs> that, that's my legacy. And I'm not here to trash my dad. I'm not here to complain about uh, the way things could have been or should have been to admit to you that I don't stand here on the shoulders of, uh, of, of many godly men and women. I am so grateful for my mom because I don't know if I'd be here without her. But short of her, there, there's not this, this godly legacy that, is, that has pushed me on. And, and perhaps as, as you heard this illustration about Jonathan Edwards and Max Jukes, you started to kind of feel a little bit bad about things Perhaps you want to believe that, that God can and will bless you and your family and your legacy. But if, if you're honest, come on, Pastor, I, I've, you don't know my past. You don't know the things that I did, you're thinking to yourself right now. You don't know the addictions that I still wrestle with. You don't know those inner demons that, that accuse me and point out my sin time and time and time again. And you think, you know, God's going to bless someone, but it, it's not going to be me, and it's not going to be my family. And if that's you, I want to give you some hope. Let's not forget the mess. And this is a big mess that Judah made. Judah and, and Tamar, right? This is not a, a, a pleasant story that people like to hear. When I asked Mickey to do the scripture reading, I'm sure as he's reading it through, he's probably thinking, "Woo, this is a doozy, right? This is not something that you brag about. Hey, look at us Christians. We've got it all together here. And, and if you think back, 
What's going on during this time when, when Judah and Tamar are, are going back and forth? Judah's brother, Joseph, was sold into slavery. Joseph was right now in Egypt. And Judah must have thought he's dead. Or he's imprisoned. Or he's some Egyptian's slave. And Judah had a lot to do with it. But God wanted to take that which was broken. God wanted to take that which the enemy thought, man, I'm going to destroy this family. I'm going to destroy this concept of God setting aside a separate people to be missionaries, to go out and spread the good news of the coming Messiah. But God did. God changed. God changed the bad to the good. And and the legacy? Let's look about the legacy. By all accounts, Tamar and Judah's children, they shouldn't have really gone anywhere, done anything, right? God surely wouldn't bless them. Look at how they came to be. But let's take a, a slightly closer look at this legacy. Perez, the son of Tamar, and Judah had a family. So remember, Tamar got impregnated by her father-in-law. And her son, Perez, he had a family. And from Perez's line, eventually, he had a son, grand, great-grandson, that married a prostitute. Well, there you go. There's that negative, or was it? Do you know who that prostitute was that Perez's great-grandson married? Rahab. And who was Rahab? She, yes, was a prostitute at one time. But she was a woman of faith. And when she was confronted by those Israelite spies that came into Jericho, what did she do? She hid them. She protected them. And she made the choice to align herself with their God, the God of the universe. A a, a prostitute named Rahab. And then if we, we think a little bit further, Rahab, she had a child became the mother of a very special man named Boaz. Does Boaz strike you as someone you know? I hope so. Hopefully you know enough of Bible history to know that that Boaz protected and provided for a Moabite woman. Oh, there you go. There's another negative thing. Or is it? Because God said to kill all the Moabites. God said to be separate from the Moabites because they worshipped false gods. But this Moabite woman rejected that heritage. And she aligned herself with a woman who was broken and had nothing going for her except one thing. You know what that one thing was? She worshipped and had faith in the one true God. And this Moabite woman said, I will be with you. I will not turn back to my false gods. Your God will be my God. And her name, anyone remember? Ruth. That's right. What a powerful woman. And she wasn't Jewish. She wasn't Israelite. She was from a line of people that should have been destroyed. She was from like a Max Jukes line. And then she had a son named Obed, and he had a son named Jesse. And who was Jesse's son? We had a few of them. The really important one, his name was what? He was the runt of the litter, David. And David, your namesake, David was a man after God's own heart. Talk about a godly legacy. This shouldn't have been the case. This doesn't make sense. Why would God do this? Names and dates and places are oftentimes, especially for people like me that are not detail-oriented, we think, oh, what's the point? But they're important because they show us what God is doing. I want to encourage all of us No matter what your family history is, no matter how many skeletons you have in your closet, don't ever let the enemy whisper lies to you that you're not worth it. Your family is just 
junk. There's nothing of value that you can bring to the Lord. And God says, no, that's not how I work. And there's another important truth that we can learn from this scripture lesson, which is that God cares about the vulnerable in our society. Tamar was a widow who didn't have much going for her. She became known as the woman who kills her husbands. She didn't do it. It seems from my reading of the scriptures that her husbands died because they had rejected God and lived evilly. But she had a really, really bad label. The woman who kills her husbands. And she didn't have Social Security to fall back on. She didn't have a pension to fall back on. She just been ignored by her father-in-law and gone off into oblivion if things didn't work out the way they did. And throughout this process, and it wasn't the way that God intended, the way that, that, that things happened, but in the midst of her and his sinful choices, we see God who is concerned and caring for the most vulnerable in our society, the widows. And as I was writing this, I started to think about Hagar. Who was Hagar? Do you guys remember Hagar? There's Abraham, and then there's Sarah, and then Sarah had a woman that was helping her out named Hagar. And she had the not-so-bright idea. Hey, uh, Abraham, you need a... You need someone to pass on your family line to. And I'm getting pretty old, right around 100 years old or so, and it's just not going to happen with me. Why don't you just have sex with my servant woman, and, and, and that, that, that'll be the one. And that's what happened. And then there was intense jealousy that was created. And then Sarah gets pregnant and has a child. And then you can imagine that rivalry that was going on. And Sarah says to her husband, hey, get rid of this woman and her child. We don't need them. Get them out of here. They weren't what God told them to be or to do. They were thrown out. They weren't part of the chosen people. Of all the people that God should have turned his back on, it should have been her, right? And then she has nothing going for her. And she's exhausted. She's hungry. She's beyond spent, she lays down and is about to die and cries out and God sends an angel to minister to her needs and says, I will make you into a great and powerful nation. And it's from her line that come the Arabs. And oftentimes we always think of the Arabs and how bad they are and the tension that we have in Israel because of them. But you know what? The Arabs, the Persians, helped set God's people free many years later. They aren't all bad or all evil. But the point is, is that God cares about those that society looks at and says, ah, don't worry about them. If we fast forward to the New Testament, we see in, Gen in James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled. What does that mean? The type of religion, the type of faith that God is calling us to have that is pure and undefiled is this. To visit orphans and widows and their affliction. If we as Christians turn a blind eye to people that are hurting and have needs and just don't care, I'd say we need to have a heart check. Now, it's hard to understand how to help the homeless. It's hard to understand how to help the drug addicts. It's hard to understand how to help without exacerbating the problem. I'm not saying it, that it's an easy solution, but I am saying this. If we look at those who are broken and, and, and don't have anything to offer anyone and turn our backs on them, then I'd say we don't have the type of religion that God is looking for. The heart behind this statement is what we see in Genesis, which is that God cares for the vulnerable. The broken families, the single moms, the mentally sick, the social outcasts, the weird ones, the awkward ones, 
The people that are confused, that are lost, that are shattered. God cares for them. Shouldn't we? And if God cares about these people, the big question is, do we care? Are we willing to be the hands and the feet that God wants us to be? Or do we say, well, that's for someone else to work and to do? You know, once we come to a place of peace and faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved from our sins. So we are washed. We are cleansed. We are forgiven. We are children of God. We can rightly be called disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. But I'm here to tell you, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we've got to follow Jesus in all ways. And that included when Jesus went into a Samaritan village and healed people and ministered to people that the Jews hated and that were very uncomfortable with and that there was tension between the two groups. The things that break Jesus' heart ought to break our heart. I was talking to a young woman that I love dearly. And she said, Dad, I've been doing my devotions and and I went to this camp and I just cried so much. And I said, why? And she said, because I think what breaks God's heart is breaking my heart. And this wasn't from Lydia. It wasn't from Madeline. It was from my daughter, Chloe. And I was so excited to see her heart breaking over what breaks God's heart. So in closing, godly legacies are important. Strong families. Man, you can leave an amazing gift for future generations. And if you have received a godly legacy, I'm thinking about the growthies. Kelly, you got a great legacy with your dad. And many of you also have great legacies. You don't have to have a pastor as a father or some missionary. Some of you have got amazing legacies. Praise be to God if that is the case. But for those of us that don't have that legacy, know that God loves you just as much. And that God can and will take that which is broken and mend it. That that God can take the legacy that that you should be passing on and, and he can say it stops here. Here with you is where it changes. Perhaps God wants to start a godly legacy with you. Also remember this. God cares for the helpless and the hopeless. And if we are followers of God, then the things that break God's heart should break our heart. And I don't have the the easy solution to fix the brokenness in the world. But if we care enough about those things that break God's heart, there would be some pretty cool changes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's difficult when we read of true stories like Judah and Tamar and things that happen the way that they did to her. And, um, Lord, it doesn't make sense. But, Lord, you, you like to get dirty. You like to roll up your sleeves. You like to take us and the brokenness of our families and the dysfunction of, of the past that we have that we've perhaps uh, been given and to change it, and to radically make something beautiful from it. And Jesus, you came from this line. That your human DNA came from Judah and Tamar. And Lord, we don't understand why you do things the way you do, but we do understand this, is that you care about us. You care about us when we are broken. You care about us when we're on cloud nine and and things couldn't be better. We are so excited to serve a risen Savior who wants that love and care and acceptance to be understood by all of humanity. Lord, give us a heart that breaks yours and help us to care for the, 
those that can't take care of themselves, that are helpless, that are hopeless. Help us to live out our faith to bring you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.